good morning and thank you for being here this morning. I've got several announcements to make you aware of this morning. Tonight, um, beginning at 5 o'clock, choir practice starts back. And I think it's been maybe a week or so since you, you folks have met, so do not uh, miss this opportunity. So choir practice is at 5 o'clock. Today, this morning, um, we are beginning an eight-week series, uh, eight-week, that's not true, eight-session series, four weeks. We'll be doing Sunday morning, Sunday night. We're studying Revelation, uh, chapters one through three. Uh, we'll begin this morning with an introduction tonight. We'll talk about the first church, and every uh, session after that we'll be talking about uh, one of the other churches that is mentioned in Revelation 1 through 3. Several different speakers will be sharing um, tonight. Uh, let me encourage you to be here. We're going to do a chili cook-off. So here's the deal. You bring pot chili uh, to share with everybody. It's just a way to uh, uh, get folks to come in and enjoy fellowshipping together, eating together. Um, the youth and children will all be participating in that part. And so we'll eat together, and then the youth and children will go their way, and we will stay and do our second session, the Church of Ephesus, tonight. Um, we have a, a, an interesting theologian that will be sharing with us, I'm sure, with a lot of different perspectives uh, this evening. So um, just be in prayer for, uh, for our speaker tonight. And then um, next week, uh, I'll be in the morning, and then my father will be here in the evening, and then the following week, I'll be sharing in the morning. I think Dixon Free is coming to share in the evening. And so just let me encourage you to be here and be a part of the evening worship services and study times. Uh, just a great time to be together and learn. Now, uh, also, if you'll take a moment and look at the corner of your bulletin, there's a place there for you to sign up for our Wednesday night meal. Uh, this week is uh, hamburger steak, coleslaw, baked potato, roll, and dessert. I see where David and Glenda are doing that. David always does a phenomenal job with the hamburger steak, so I encourage you to be here and be a part uh, if you can. And then on the back side of that is a place for members and visitors uh, to sign. If you will sign that, out, uh, sign that, drop it in the belt, drop it in the offering plate, uh, and we would greatly appreciate it. I'll get off that out in a minute. Matty Shaw is going to come and have an announcement for us. Um, so. Again, thank you for being here this morning, and uh, we pray that it is a worship experience for you back. I just have two reminders that the tennis team is selling barbecue tickets to buy our steak rings, and they're only $9, so even if you don't want to buy one, you just want to make a donation or something, it would really help, we really love that, you know, we really want those bright, shiny rings to show everybody in Catawba County that we're just better than them. So, um, also... That I'm having a blood drive next Saturday, January 12th from 10 to 2. So if you want to come out and get blood, I would really like that. It'll help the community and me. But if you can't, you can always, if you don't want to come that day, you can always go to the blood center and donate at a later time if you thought. So just a reminder. A few weeks ago when we were here and we introduced the uh, state championship tennis team, you guys were all so proud of them. Stood up, gave them a standing ovation. So in that point, you all need to buy tennis. <coughs> That's all I got to say about that. Okay? Help support them. Uh, and so it will be here Friday, and uh, I think the barbecue will be okay. Just because I'm fixing it. So there you go. Smile, guys. Laugh. Light up. Change this. Enjoy being here. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house this Lord, help us to put all of our distractions away so that we can focus on you this morning. And what your word has to say to us. God, thank you for bringing us together to fellowship and to worship. God, might our worship of song through song to you be pleasing to you. Because we're singing about you and your love. God, hear our prayers. 
because we trust you with all of who you are. Because you've created us. And you know our inner being, our inner soul, our inner thoughts. God, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask now to take a hymn book and turn to hymn number two. We're going to stand and sing together. Holy, holy, holy. Let's stand as we sing together. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, you sound so lovely. <laughs> All right. I'm just going to bypass that. Uh, I want to talk this morning about travel. Now that you're back at school and everybody's in their regular schedule, did anybody know why you were out of school go on a trip? Yeah? Where'd you go? Carolyn's. Okay, did you know how to get to Charlotte? No, you didn't? Okay. Anybody else go on a trip? Yes, where did you go? 
made in high school. Did you know how to get to made in high school? <laughs> anybody else go on a trip? Okay, has anybody been on a trip before? Yes. You went to the beach. Did you know how to get to the beach? Nope. Yes. Disney World. Did you know how to get to Disney World? Yes or no? Did you know how to get to Disney World? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's talk about how we travel. Now, one thing that we do when we travel is we know where we want to go, but we we've got to know how to get there. Now, long time ago, you don't remember this. That when we traveled, we had to use road maps. Does anyone know what a road map looks like? Yes. It's exactly right. I laid one out just to show you, and I left it. But what a road map was, it would be a piece of paper, and you would unfold it like 40 times, and you could find all the highways. <coughs> And then you can find where it is, which city or place that you wanted to go on. But the place was only a dot. And you had to follow where you began and where you wanted to end. And you had to figure out which road to take. Now, the, good, the, the, the only good thing the map was for was to get you from one dot to the other. But once you got to the dot you were traveling to, You didn't know where you were going. It just got you to the dot. So to get from the dot to the place that you needed to be, you had to have somebody to give you directions. And they'd say, well, you go down to this road to the stoplight and you turn right, you go two blocks, then turn left and go for three miles, and then you turn right by the oak tree, go down this windy road, and when you see a rock, it's our driveway. Okay? Now, things have changed. All right? Now all you gotta do is if you know where you're going, you go to, this is the greatest thing, you go find the big G, okay? Google Maps. Tap on G and look. You can see anywhere that you wanna go in the world. And if you hit directions and say start, you don't have to look at it anymore. All you have to do is tells us exactly where to go, how far we have to look forward to before we turn right, how long it's gonna take us to get there, Sometimes it'll say, well, you've got road construction, possible detours, and we go somewhere else. Well, let's talk about a trip in the Bible. And this is a trip I know that you all, you know, you're going to recognize. This is about the trip of the, the Magi, the wise men. Okay? You know what we're talking about now? Everybody's got it. All right. In... Uh, in Matthew 2, 1 through 2, we're talking about the trip that after Jesus was born, and this is probably somewhere around two years after he was born, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, did the wise men have a map? Did they have the big G? No, what did they have? They had the star. The star guided the wise men to Jesus. Now what actually happened is, the Magi followed the star to a place called Jerusalem. Okay? Now it's kind of like traveling on our map. It gets us to a dot, but it gets us to the exact place. So they get to Jerusalem and they start asking questions like, where do we find Jesus? We know that He's somewhere near you. Where do we find Him? Well, the king who was in Jerusalem, King Herod, he's kind of a suspicious character. Right? He's a mean kid, yeah. So he, uh, he, uh, he hears about this. So he invites the Magi to come have a meeting with him. And, and, and they talk about why they're there, Herod tells him, and says, look, I want him to go to Bethlehem because that's where he's going to be located. And the reason why Herod knew this, he had consulted with a lot of 
priests and, and people who were familiar with what the prophecy said said, well, he's in Bethlehem. So Herod had an alternative plan, but he told the wise men to go find him in Bethlehem. So, the wise men take off. Now, did they pick up a map in Jerusalem? Oh, what did they have to get them to Bethlehem? The star. The star took them from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. All right. Now, they found Jesus. Now, he wasn't a baby anymore, so he was about two years old. You know any two-year-olds? Your little brother's too. There you go. Uh, Xander's got a little brother. He's two. Okay, so think about that. He's a little toddler now running around. Okay, he's no longer a baby in a manger. So the wise men get and they find him. And what do you think they do? Well, first of all, they bowed down and they worshiped him. Why did they worship him? You're exactly right. Okay? Then they gave him gifts. What are some of the gifts they gave him? Yep. More? Myrtle. <laughs> Yes. Gold. <laughs> How would you like to have those kind of gifts? Uh, diamonds? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. You would like to have the gifts. Why well, don't we all want Okay, now, today, people still search for Jesus. But we don't have a star. We don't have a road map. We don't have the big Jeep because you can't find him on earth. Okay, where's Jesus at? He is in heaven. So our star and our map and our map is the Bible. Do we understand that? So we read the Bible. We we follow the directions that the Bible tells us, the things that we need to do, how we need to act, how we need to treat other people, what we need to do, how, what we need to believe in our hearts. Okay? And when we follow those directions, this map is going to lead us right to where Jesus is. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank You for, for all these children, Lord. We thank You for the families that they represent. Lord, we thank You for Your Son. And we thank You for, for all the blessings that we have. Lord, we ask now that You would be with us, be with these child. Help us to grow. Help us to learn. Help us to follow the way to find You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm very thankful for the maps uh, and Google Maps, but I'm very thankful for God's map, His Bible, that teaches us the way to go. I'll be honest, when I first got here, um, everybody said, go to Jody Burger and hang a right. Where's Jody Burger? <laughs> it doesn't even exist anymore. It's something else. And, you know, when people know things as one way, it's kind of hard for us to learn a new way. So uh, just uh, know that God's way is the right way. Let's stand and greet one another in the Lord's name. Let's welcome each other to the house of the Lord. <laughs>
We're going to read the Scripture together. The Scripture this morning is Revelation 1, 1 through 8. It should be on the screen. Would you join me in reading Revelation 1, 1 through 8? The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of his Christ. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by his love. And he has to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierce him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. May the Lord bless the reading of his Holy Scripture.
beginning of the book of Revelation, Revelation uh, chapter 1. And so as we look at the book of Revelation, I think it's appropriate to kind of figure out exactly what's going on, where we are, kind of our time frame in which we're looking uh, to maybe help us in, in the days and weeks to come. There are four or five things that I want you to realize out of this first part of Revelation. And it's talking about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. And until we realize that in this particular book, and until we realize that until in our own particular lives, we're going to be amiss and we're going to be uh, struggling. So for this particular information, just understand everything is about Jesus. This book is about Jesus. This whole book is about Jesus. And that's your holy Bible. Okay? And so what we're learning today as we begin, um, John receives a revelation from Jesus himself. And he's writing this 
from the island of Patmos. But before we get there, I want you to write down five things about Jesus. Jesus is eternal. We find that in Revelation 1 4. Jesus is faithful. We find that in Revelation 1 5a. That's the first part of that verse. Jesus is liberating. Revelation 1 5b. That's the second part of 5. Jesus is empowering. That's Revelation 1 6. And finally, Jesus is returning. And that is found in Revelation 1, 7, and 8. Come to grips with the idea that Jesus, this is about Jesus. And to be real frank with you, this gathering should be about Jesus. And if it's not, then something's wrong. Your reason for coming here today should have been about Jesus. Your reason for coming here today shouldn't have been about the, the boy or the girl that you're interested in. It shouldn't have been about your husband or your wife nagging you. It shouldn't have been about anything except Jesus. And when we realize that our lives are about Jesus, then we will understand our meaning in life and His meaning in our life. Okay. So, Revelation 1, 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show His servants. And by the way, y'all can put that up there. What must soon take place? He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. The revelation that Jesus himself appeared to John, or a revelation of Jesus appeared to John, however, whether it be in a vision, whether it be in a dream, however it is, it, he appeared to John on the island of Patmos. Now, what we're going to learn tonight is he's writing about several churches, seven to be exact, seven churches in verses in chapters one through three. Tonight we're going to begin the first church of Ephesus, and each church has a meaning and a, and a and a correction that goes with it. And the reason I share that with you is this: until we're willing to take correction in our lives and realize that we don't have it all together, many of us realize we don't have it all together. But the problem is we don't realize that it's Jesus that we're searching for. I heard it once said that we all have a hole in our heart and it's what they call a God-sized hole. Not necessarily meaning that it's infinite, but it is. But the, here's the point, and that's this. It's only a hole that can be filled by Jesus. And until we realize that that hole can only be filled by Jesus, we try to pour everything else into that hole and we feel unfulfilled. We feel empty. And part of the reason is we're leaving out our Creator, the one who loves us, the one who died for us, and that being Jesus Christ. Now, so this revelation of Jesus, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. Now, I share that with you guys because I said there's seven churches that he's talking about. And what he's doing is he's talking to these churches about some good things, but also some things that need correcting. These things need to soon take place. But what is to soon take place is Jesus' is second coming. What we don't realize is this particular book was written probably around 95. A.D. After the death of Jesus, somewhere around the year 95, this book was written. John wrote this book. The Apostle John. The disciple John wrote this book. And with that being said, think about 95. Well, if Jesus was born in 
somewhere between zero and four. John's kind of an old guy. <coughs> Let me tell you something about John. The gospel. John, the writer of the gospel. John, the apostle. Do you realize that John, the writer of the book of Revelation, was willing to die for his faith? Do you know that they put him in a vat? A big boiling water. They tried to kill him by boiling him today. Did you know that? He survived. I can only imagine his pain. I can only imagine what he went through in recovery, but he survived. To still tell about the love of Jesus Christ. You think you're suffering? Yeah, some of us are, and I'm not making light of that. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is here to walk with you through. John, this writer of Revelation, was exiled to the island of Patmos. Okay? So if you take modern day Turkey and kind of look at the coastline, just off the coastline, 40 some odd miles maybe, is this little island of Patmos. And that was really kind of a place where they took those who did not agree with, well, Rome. They exiled them over there. They put them over there. Some of them they made hard slave, slave trade labor. Some of them they just put over there. We don't know exactly what John was doing. Some say he could have been working in a mine. Some say he could have just been over there because they exiled him to quit uh, to keep him from making trouble in, in Asia. But yet he made some of the biggest statements for us as Christians from that island of Patmos. Being exiled in prison, he lived over there. So this is the concept or context in which he's being getting this revelation. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God. And the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads these words of prophecy. Or the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it. And take it to heart. What is written in it. Because the time is here. Now the reason I shared with you. It was 95. That seems like an awful long time ago. Jesus was coming back. That's 2,000 years ago. Jesus is coming back. Well, let's take a look here. Let's go on a little bit further. Um, go down to uh, verse 4. To the seven churches of the prophets of Asia. Grace and peace to you. From him who is, who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. Who is a faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead. And the ruler of the kings of the earth. Notice the lack of capitalization with kings. So it's talking about earthly kings. Jesus is the king of kings. Which means capitalized. This is. Lord kings, kings of the earth. But also back up. <coughs> the firstborn from the dead. You ever thought about that? What's the firstborn from the dead? Jesus died. Jesus was raised to life by God the Father. Jesus is still living. He is the firstborn of the dead. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then we have the opportunity to live with Him forever and be a part of that promise and that kingdom in which He began. And if you want to think about 
he began at that point, but he also began at the very beginning when it was created. He was there with the Father. Who was, who is, and who is to come. I have to draw a line. And so my question to you is, on that line, put a dot where you are right now. Put a dot on that line where you are right now. It's a timeline. Now the reason I ask you to do that is this. Before that dot, God was. Where that dot is right now, God is. And before you get to the next part, God is already there. Who is, who was, and who is to come. God doesn't live in time. We're the only ones that live in time. God created time. God created time by the ways and things that He does things. And, and by the way, God created time the time that we live in with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And the reason I say that is because we count a day when what? What goes around? When the moon and the sun over the earth or the earth over the That's a day to us. But God created those things. We found that out in Genesis. And when he created those things, one of these days, those things are probably going to burn out. I can't tell you when, but I can also say this. He is beyond that. Now, our problem with the way we live today is we live where you are in that dock. That's what we're concerned with is that dock. We don't necessarily care about what's after that dot. <clears throat> now think about it. I, I made a really bold statement right there. If we did, wouldn't we want others to know about Jesus? Wouldn't this place be full on Sundays? Wouldn't Cornerstone be full on Sundays? Wouldn't East Maiden be full on Sundays? Wouldn't the Lutheran church down there people on Sundays because we care about sharing the word of God. We care about worshiping God. We care about worshiping the creator of who he is and who he was and who he is to come. The problem is we're focused on now. And we don't understand that God is the creator of all. What? Yeah. And it's tough. Now, if you read Revelation 1, um, the entire chapter is not that long. You'll find this place several different places and in several different statements. So I think it's very important to understand that Jesus, the one that we worship, the one that we claim as king of our hearts, is creator of all. Even tomorrow. He's already there. Hmm. Let's go on. Let's pick up. Uh, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's Jesus. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God. And Father, to Him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look! He's coming with the clouds. And every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. Now, the reason I share that with you is this. I just talked about this timeline. I just talked about those. He was there then. He is here today. And he's there in the next time. So when Jesus comes, even those who pierced Him... We'll see him coming. Process that if you will. So shall it be. Amen. 
And the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The beginning, the end. It's really the word, it's really the verb to be, is really what it is. To be. <coughs> because to be, the verb, has, it depends on how you do it, was, is, to be. <coughs> he is the I am. Verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, that's just what I told you all a few minutes ago. That's why he was there. Because he was testifying about Jesus. They exiled him to Patmos. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Alright, let me pause. Let me give you. Revelation is full of, 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 of uh, symbolism. Okay? And a lot of times we don't uh, quite get a lot of it, so I'm going to try to help a little bit. But also, Revelation is full of numbers. Numbers are very important. And, and eventually, hopefully, I'll touch on some of that as we teach through this. But what we have are seven golden lampstands. Now, those were the seven churches that he just mentioned. That's what, he's, that's what they're called. He's among the seven churches. Now, he says, listen, what does he say? And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now, what he's fixing to do is give you a description of Jesus. Now, this is one description that we find of Jesus in the book of Revelation. There are many others, and they're not all the same, but this is one description of the book of, excuse me, of what Jesus looked like. Now, let me promise you, it's not going to be the headshot that you see back in one of these rooms with the long flowing locks. Kind of stoic looking face. That's not what you're going to see here. It's going to be shocking if you've not read it. Dressed in a robe, okay, I'm good with that, reaching down to his feet, yeah, with a golden sash around his chest, okay, yeah. His head and hair were white like wool. What? <coughs> Maybe a little bit, I guess. As white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. That's not the picture of Jesus, not picture of Jesus. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing water. You ever heard rushing water? You ever stop to hear rushing water? Like really rushing water. It's like power. And that's kind of what I'm picturing here. Matter of fact, um, one of the best pictures for me, especially around here, is if you ever cross Oxford Dam um, or you go down... Uh, is that 16? Is that what it is? Yeah. You go down 16, and you cross over, and you see Oxford Dam when they got the gates up. And if you were to pause and just listen to the power of the rushing water coming through there, and that's the picture that I'm hearing of what it could possibly be like. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And uh, at this particular point, the seven stars are uh, the seven angels of the seven churches that he's talking about. But, let me go one step further, could easily be the seven leaders of those churches. The seven pastors, possibly. Okay? In his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the shining sun shining in all its brilliance. Is that your picture? Ah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our Jesus is more than we can ever imagine. He's more powerful than we can ever imagine. He's more than what we ever picture. And you're going to find a couple of other places in Revelation that we're given other pictures of Jesus. You do know that Jesus came as kind of the antithesis of what the world was looking for in the same right? Keep going. When I saw him, I fell at his feet. Now, this is John. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. Now, read that slowly and process who was, who is, and who is to come. Let me reread it. Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Future. This man we call Jesus. This God that we call Jesus. This King of kings. Lord of lords. Is he King and King and Lord of Lord of you? Because if he's not, do you understand he holds the keys to death and Hades? You're playing with fire, ladies and gentlemen. You read into that what you want to. <laughs> Write, therefore, verse 19, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Again, prepare. It's here. And what will come the mystery of the seven stars that you hold it, that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Then he goes on to say, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things. Okay. That's tonight. Now, the title of the sermon today is God wins. God wins. Y'all hate losing as bad as I do. <laughs> kind of the joke around my house, or even with, you know, last week I talked about Drew, this week I'm going to talk about Maggie. Bless you. Maggie hates to lose. It doesn't matter if it's cards, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Ping pong. She hates to lose. I have to be honest. She got it. Honestly. I hate to lose. Hate it. I don't care what it is. Matter of fact, I hate to lose so badly that unfortunately, I might do just whatever it takes to win. Yeah, I tripped the guy one time in church with basketball. <laughs> I got thrown out of the church league basketball game one time. <laughs> when I was younger. And here's the thing. I know my limits now. Therefore, I don't play church league basketball. <laughs> and I'm being real honest. There are certain things I know I can't do. And I have to know my limits. I hate to lose. At one time in my life when I was a little more active than I am now. I picked up weightlifting simply because I wasn't competing against anybody but myself. But when I compete against somebody... I'm going to win. Because I hate to lose. Maggie's the same way. She's playing a PE teacher just in a pickup game of ping pong. She got mad. 
She got all kind of attitude. It's a pickup game of ping pong. Who cares? Well, she hates the looks. I busted more than one racquetball racket. Because I hate the looks. So here's my question. God wins. Why do we want to be on his team? That's the point. He's on the winning side. So why do we play with all this other stuff and make it king and lord of our lives when God wins and we're told he wins and we know the end of the book, but yet we want to play with fire? Why do we do that? Why can't we just say, God, be lord of my life? I'll follow. You want to know why? Because we want to be And I'm guilty of that. When do we release and say, God, it's yours? Because you already know what tomorrow holds, and I trust you with it. But instead, we want to take it and make it be what we want it to be and not what He has it to be for us. The starting point of the book of Revelation is we're told in the beginning He wins and now He's going to tell us how we can help ourselves and help others to come to know this saving love of Jesus Christ. Ah, let's just get started. <coughs> Five points I gave you. Remember, Jesus is eternal. He is faithful. He is liberated. He is empowered. And He is returning. I know you've heard this, probably asked before. But here's a question. If you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow. Would you change the way you live for the rest of today? What would you do? <coughs> Who would you tell? Yeah, because I want to tell you this, and you know it by reading the Bible, that no one knows when He's coming back, only the Father. Because we're told that. So be ready. <laughs> I think that's part of Revelation. Be ready. That timeline that you looked at, you're just a dial. As a matter of fact, you're just a dot. Period. In the timeline of life. But wouldn't we want it to be a big dot? Because we're daddy dots. <laughs> Jesus loves you. And I encourage you to come back tonight. Bring a pot of chili. Share with us all. And we'll continue to learn what he has to say to us from the church of Ephesus. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love you. God, sometimes we don't always live like it. And it's, it's difficult. And God, I, I pray that as we continue to study this book of Revelation, that you will be number one in our life. Challenge us today the days to come to be that. That we will step out and say, Jesus, we love you. And we want to follow you. Because when you called our name, we ran out of that prayer. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You need to make a decision this morning. I'll be down for you. You just want to come and pray. You want somebody, if you need to pray for somebody, you just need to say, God, take it. Man, I've been holding on it too long. Just lay it here to the altar. I'll pray with you. Bonnie will be here to pray with you. You can just kneel and pray. We're going to sing the song Amazing Grace. It's been a while since we've sung it, but it's true. A beautiful song. Do you believe in that grace? Don't hesitate. You got a decision to make. We'll be down. Let's stand as we sing. Amazing grace. Together. Hymn number three. Third. <laughs>
say thank you for being here today. It's been an honor to worship with you. Start the new year off right. I'm just telling you. Get in God's Word. Find out what He has to say to you. And how we can follow Him. And what He has for our lives. Donovan, if you would, close us. Don't forget about tonight. Look forward to seeing you here. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much. And we thank you this morning for loving us. Um, for God forgiving us for when we fail you. For sending your son Jesus down on the cross for our sins, God. So that we may have a relationship with you. God, I pray that each morning that we wake up, we understand that it's a new day. God, that you give us grace and you give us mercy daily. And I pray that we decide as a church and as a community um, to give our lives to you and to follow you daily. God, be with us and lead us and direct us. We love you, so in Jesus' name.